And so I want to move forward with uh, Martin's site and hopefully wrap this up today and then tomorrow get into heat treatments and steel alloys so we can wrap up in time for our uh, exam that's coming up. So we had mentioned on Friday that Martin's site is a shear transformation like twinning, except whereas twinning is for the most part driven by um, mechanical forces, Martin's site is really a thermal, thermal process, or let's just say a thermal process because there is no uh, um, time dependency on it. Basically, once you cool down to a given uh, temperature, you start, and as you continue to cool, when you hit your Martin site finish time, you'll be at 100%. Martin site provided that you are cooling quickly enough that you miss the nose of the uh, perlite, bainite, or Vidman statin transformations on the TTT diagrams. All right. And that unlike twinning, which was a pure shear, Martin site generally has a shear and a tensile component uh, associated with the transformation. And in steels, these uh, can be quite large. We're looking at 20% shear with nearly a 10% normal component, which gives us a fairly significant strain that needs to be, uh, that needs to be accommodated. And in a polycrystal, the Martin site labs tend to take these lenticular shapes because that's the shape that minimizes the strain energy, right? If you ever want a fun, elasticity problem, you can try and work out why that's the case, right? Which also means that this interface, much like the twinning interface, has to now be an incoherent interface because we're not keeping the uh, perfect parallel uh, relationship with the habit planes. And that if we're in a single crystal and the Martin site plates can traverse across the entire grain, we do get these parallel plates that are parallel to the, uh, these parallel boundaries that are parallel to the habit plane of Martin site, which the habit plane is basically the same as a twinning plane. It's an undistorted plane where nothing, the atoms are uh, all in their original position. And that if a Martin site lab strikes the surface, we get kinking, right? Much in the same way that we saw with bainite or with uh, uh, twins. And so, again, as with everything in steel, depending on where we are, we have orientation relationships. The frustrating thing is these are only approximate orientation relationships. So we've talked about Kurjimov, the kurjimov sachs relationship before, and that's sort of a nominal Martin site orientation relationship in uh, um, low carbon, uh, I mean, in, right up in, in low alloy steels. And so if you have, uh, um, but we never actually observe it. Things are sort of Kurjimov sacks. There's another important orientation relationship, uh, Nisiyama Wasserman. And what we see is that the same planes, the 111 plane, is uh, in the austenite is parallel to the 011 plane in the Martin site, uh, but they differ by about a 5.3 degree rotation uh, between Kurjimov Sachs and Nishiyama Wasserman. And Grenier Troiano is this relationship that's sort of in the middle. The axes are slightly misaligned, 
and we have a rotation of the directions of about 2.7. So it's fairly close to in between of these two, but in reality, no um, sample that you look at will actually exhibit uh, this exact orientation relationship. The orientation relationship um, varies from sample to sample. It will vary within sample depending on the local carbon content or the local cooling rate, right? And in general, the orientation relationship is going to be invariant. I mean, not invariant, irrational, right? So these are just sort of approximates, right? And in fact, from the um, phenomenological theory of Martin site that we'll be talking about today, um, it's actually impossible to get a perfect Kerjimov Sachs, and there's only one sort of way you can get Granier Triano. I, I mean, uh, Nishiyama Wasserman. Um, and so these are sort of like these idealized uh, um, relationships that you never actually see in a real sample. Right? So. Basically, like everything else, like with steel, it's close, but not exactly Kerjimov sacks. Okay, so we have to think about, we're going from a face-centered cubic structure to body-centered tetragonal or BCC, depending on our, our uh, oh man, see, you're confusing me. You're sitting in the back today. <laughs> it's... It's it's messing with me. The distribution of students in the classroom is now is now now skewed. So we have to go from a a FCC to a BCT or BCC unit cell, depending on the material and the carbon content, right? And so how can how does this process uh, actually happen? And Bain in 1924 suggested just by looking at drawings that we take the FCC unit cell, we can actually sort of envision it as a BCT unit cell. So here's two FCC, and here if we sketch out, we can sort of think of it as a BCT lattice as well. And that basically, to get to uh, a BCC structure, all we have to do is compress along the C axis and expand along this A axis. And now we have a, a um, BCC uh, unit cell, or if we depending on the amount we compress on long C and the amount we stretch along A, uh, BCT. And so this is what's known as a Bain strain or a Bain distortion. Um, and this is useful for visualizing how much the atoms change position, but this is not an actual mechanism by which martensite can form, right? As we'll see that a, Bain, a pure Bain distortion like this doesn't leave any invariant planes, right? So it doesn't preserve the habit plane uh, of Martin site. So this, this is sort of a useful analogy, a useful visualization for sort of seeing how it is possible and how little you actually need to change the position of each atom relative to each other, but it's not a mechanism. Right? Right. And just to, as a reminder that the carbon uh, um, in the BCC, right, we're, we're in the uh, um, octahedral site, right, which gives us a distortion, right? We get a greater distortion along the uh, Z direction, and that's what gives us our BCT, BCT structure, right? Because our octahedral sites in BCC, despite it being a more open structure, our interstitial sites are actually smaller. There's less room to accommodate the carbon than in the, the uh, 
FCC uh, structure. And you know, as I make a point here, the Bain distortion doesn't give us the orientation relationship. The story is just, it's too simple, it's incomplete. But remember in 1924, we didn't have things like, uh, right, it was before the electron microscope, right? So we didn't necessarily have um, any of the tools to show that, yeah, there is this undistorted point. Right? That was not something that was even widely that was understood at that point in time. This was just a mechanism of, we knew we had x-ray, we had x-ray diffraction, so we knew what the lattice was before and after the Martin site transformation, but we didn't know anything about the structure of it because we had no way of interrogating. Right? Okay. So this argument is sort of convoluted. Um, I want to go through it, but don't spend a lot of time sort of uh, try and see the sort of the geometry of it, but don't like this is not going to be an exam question, right? Show this the Bain. The Bain strain, Bain distortion does not leave an undistorted plane. Okay, so let's imagine uh, we have a, a Bain distortion that converts this face centered cubic lattice into a body entered lattice. Body centered, obviously. Right. And so the Bain distortion is our minimum of distortion. So Let's pretend we have, we're going to pretend there is an undistorted plane from this and then sh argue that that's not possible, right? Because if we have um, one change, we have to have, we have, to, we have to have another. Okay. So let's pretend that this line AB doesn't change length, right, from the distortion. We can see that any other line, right, any other line is going to, uh, going to have to, by the same argument where we looked at the shear transformation and twinning. Remember how there was only one, one line that defined the K2 plane that after the shear didn't change lengths, right? Right, it's one that, is split exactly the shear angle uh, halfway, right? So let's pretend that that's line uh, AB, right? And so to be an invariant plane, this uh, mustn't change. And BM is sort of the wraparound of the plane. So this line ABM, defines a plane, uh, right, this, if this line doesn't also change length, then ABM possesses uh, the characteristic that after it change, that after the, sh the shape transformation, these two lines don't plane, uh, don't change. So that's the first part of being an invariant plane, but if you work through it, you'll see that this angle A has to change by the stretching of the C-axis and the, uh, the compression of the C-axis and the stretching of the A-axis. These pictures are sort of backwards of how we usually talk about it. Here it starts as the cube and then we stretch C and compress A, right? And if these lines are the same, the only way that works is that if this angle, the angle changes, right? And if this angle changes, that means this plane has to be distorted, right? And this plane, this plane ABM can't be an undistorted plane, right? And so since this, these lines define, the, these lines that define the plane were the only ones that didn't change length, right? It means that if this one's not the undistorted plane, that no, no plane can be the undistorted plane, okay? So the Bain distortion doesn't give us the whole picture. In the 50s, 
the phenomenological theory of Martin site transformation was put forward, right? And this basically says it's, it's actually three parts that we need to define how Martin site transforms, right? First, our Bain distortion, which gives us a FCC to BCT lattice, right? And then we need a shear, right, which maintains the new lattice symmetry. So it's very much like a twinning shear, right, which is why we did twinning first, right? And then this in the Bain distortion and then the shear on top of it gives us an undistorted plane, right? However, now this undistorted plane uh, possesses a different orientation in space in the parent and the uh, product lattices, right? So to be a true undistorted plane, it needs to have the same spatial. So then we need an added rotation on top of that to um, keep that plane in the same position it would be in both the parent and the uh, um, Martin site, right? So we, we take a region. Remember, this is happening internal to a body, so we have to maintain consistency, right? We're, we're growing inside a parent austenite. So we can go through our Bain distortion and then shear, but if our planes don't aren't the same way, that means we now have either a gap or an overlap of material, right? So it's an in, the, the first two steps of these are incompatible deformation put together. So we need this rotation to make sure everything, um, to make sure everything fits, okay? So, um, I w we're going to go through the sh this. I'm going to go through very quickly. There's sort of a, a bit of uh, detail here, but we're going to step away for steel for a couple minutes and look at the indium thallium system because this is a it's a shape memory alloy that doesn't have a whole lot of practical applications but it's very important theoretically because the strains are small. So that means it's been studied extensively. So we sort of have an understanding of, of, of how everything um, goes. So if we go through the Bain transformation and we look at all the, uh, planes are all the directions that are undistorted. They form this cone, which we call the Bain cone. Right? And that if we then go through the transformation, right, the, the, if we squish C and expand A, our cone, this bottom angle becomes uh, becomes wider, right? And so if we sketch the habit plane on here, we can see that the vectors on the habit plane, this P and P prime, these change, right? This angle POQ uh, changes, and so the position here the position here uh, changes, right? And so this is sort of the, just the geometry uh, of the transformation. So we'll define some plane here that, that we're, we're gonna call the habit, the habit plane. For the indium thallium transformation, it's the 011 plane. So, so then basically think of our defining these, our K1 and K2 planes in the same way that we do uh, 
that we do for twinning, right? All right, so we've got our plane that passes through the line Q0, QO, right? Here. And this becomes our <clears throat> first undistorted plane in the same sense of twinning. And then at almost 90 degrees to that, right, we have a plane that goes through line P0 that is the second undistorted plane, uh, uh, K2. Right. And so it's a little a little confusing and the geometry of this in the grand scheme of things isn't super important. Um, what is important is that if we want line P0, PO, I'm sorry, to be undistorted before and after the Bain strain, we saw how it got the, the cone got squished. We need a shear to bring that back into place, right? So this shows the K2 plane before the shear and our K2 plane uh, after the shear, right? And so we have our shear and now we need a uh, rotation to bring everything uh, to bring everything back. So the shear gives us an undistorted plane. Then we need the rotation because it doesn't satisfy the requirements of the habit plane. So it's a little confusing. The 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 folks of you that are interested in crystallography, you can work through it. It's explained. I took the figures out of the reading from Reed Hill. Um, it's not the most thorough um, uh, explanation. Christian has a good explanation um, in his book. I put that up in the extra reading, although the language in Christian is very difficult to follow. And uh, um, Porter and Easterling don't even attempt to explain the crystallography of it. They're just like, uh, yeah, this is how it happens. Right. We'll, we'll wave our, we'll wave our hands. So, you know, there's, there's a lot, a lot going on here. And again, the important part is just to understand that if we want to um, to, to change the lattice and keep an undistorted habit plane, right, undeformed habit plane, we need three steps, right? We need the Bain transformation, we need a shear, and then we need a, a essentially a rigid body rotation of the lattice. Okay, so. So how does that shear take place, right? Well, there's a, two ways it can happen, right? We can either do that through slips, a series. Imagine if we have a series of dislocations, right? And think about this as like a deck of cards shearing. If we pass dislocations on each of those planes, we can build up a... Uh, a shear, and if we have these dislocation, these these slip planes are dislocations pass at regular enough intervals, right? We can approximate the the total the shear we need as homogeneous. Instead, it's actually sort of these little steps, right? Because we don't pass exact the exact right amount of dislocations on each on each plane uh, to make it up. But this is one way that we can get the um, required shear, right? 
and we see slipped Martin Sykes a lot, right? So here we see the lenticular Martin Sight laugh, and we see the slip lines uh, going up to it, and this shows the surface relief, right? This was a polished sample. Mart the Martin Sight tra Martin Sight transformation was allowed to happen, right? And then if you look at it through a microscope, you'll see the surface the surface relief, right? So these are sort of classic. Uh, um, classic examples, right? It's also possible to get the strain through mechanical twinning, right? So we talked about how twinning gives a shear, right? That doesn't change the lattice, which is exactly what we need. But if the entire lattice is twinned, right, that just changed the orientation of the entire lattice. So that doesn't help us at all, right? Because that doesn't accommodate uh, um, accommodate. So what we actually need are these two different twins, right? Of two different twin variants that have um, Opposing shears, right? Or right. So we have a net. Uh, um, a net step. So why do we get two variants, right? And so remember, the twin needs to leave has all the restrictions on it that we that we had placed before. Uh, sort of, sort of muddling this point up a little bit. So let me let me backtrack, right? Twins can't shear an arbitrary amount, right? They have to deform, right? We need to leave the K1 plane and K2 planes undistorted. And the only way is that that can happen for the twin system is to leave, right? Is we have to have a well-defined amount of shear, right? For the dislocations, we could pass more or less dislocations to get the total amount of macroscopic shear. With twinning, we can't do that. But, right, it would either be too much or too little to give us our Martin site habit plane, right? So if we shear too much, we can put some twins back in that are a different variant where the shear is in an opposite sense, right, and sort of kink our lattice back kink back and forth with these sets of parallel twins and by getting the volume fraction of the two different twin variants correct we get the total shear we need right so we may overshoot by by 25 percent of the shear we need so if we just put in a a, a 30 percent volume fraction of twins that go the other way Right, if we put 100% in or 50% in, we would basically just have a, a, we'd go back and forth, back and forth. It'd be just like an accordion bellows, right? It would be up and down, right? So we overshoot and we put some back in to bring it, to bring it back. And basically in this indium thallium system, we need one third uh, twins, right? Of opposite sort of variants. To, uh, to keep it. And this just sort of shows the macroscopic geometry, right? Here's the, the FCC structure, here's our BCT, and here's our, uh, here's our twins. Right. And this is just sort of another, another schematic of the, of the same thing, and that we have three parts. We have a vein strain, a rigid body rotation, and a uh, line strain, which is our our twinning. Right, just sort of different different notions. Okay, so this theory we have to be careful about it because 
It's called the phenomenological theory of Martensitic transformation. So what what does phenomenological mean? Right? It it it's a description of what we observe, but it doesn't tell us anything about why it happens. Right? There is this is a um a mechanism by which we can go from FCC to BCT, right? And have all the features that we observe in Martin site. But it doesn't tell us why this is the correct way or what's actually happening atomistically to make it happen, right? It doesn't tell us what the driving force of each of these steps are. It doesn't tell us anything about the energetics of this. It doesn't... Um, allow us to predict what systems are going to uh, have Martin Cidic transformations a priori, right? We don't have a theory uh, for that yet, right? But what are the successes, okay? Well, so... Uh, First, and the biggest one, it explains the existence of irrational Martin site habit planes, right? In contrast to twinning, where the habit plane is typically rational, right? We talked about type 1 and type 2 twins. In metals, most of them are compound twins, so that guarantees that we're going to have a rational, a rational uh, twinning plane, right? And so the other thing it, it, it did was it predicted the fine structure, either the twinning structure or the slip of Martin site before it was actually observed in the microscope, right? So it wasn't like the people working on this in the 50s said, oh, we see these twins in Martin site. Let's, how do we explain it? They came up with this theory of the transformation working strictly from what do we need to keep the crystallography intact? And it predicted that we needed twins or slip. And then people went to the microscope and found both cases. Right? So from a phenomenological theory, that's fantastic. From a pure science theory, it's sort of less than satisfactory because we still don't have a why. Right? So we do see in steels that we have a sort of critical carbon content, right, where the uh, habit plane cha changes, the habit plane uh, shifts. So in low carbon steels, the habit plane is near 111, right, and this is the, uh, these are, this is experimental observation, right, so this is the region where in low carbon steels we see the habit plane, right, as we increase uh, the carbon content, we move down this line and we start to see the Martin site uh, habit plane be this 225 plane, right? And then as we get into approach 2% carbon, we move to uh, seeing the two, this near habit planes that are near 259, all right? So uh, it's not a fixed orientation relationship that we, we can't look on there. It's not a pinpoint, right? If we look in the same sample and we measure the habit planes, we see that they really form this cloud around um, a point. And we tend to see Mostly slipped Martin sites here and mostly twin Martin sites here, right? So this makes sense because what's our slip plane in FCC, right? 111. And this just sort of gives the uh, a bunch of observations of different steels, different, uh, a couple other different uh, metal systems that undergo uh, 
um, market sites. Right. And you see is, uh, depending on the alloying compositions, you even move away. Right. You shift away from 259 to other weird, uh, near other weird planes. Okay. So as we mentioned before, martensite is a thermal in nature, right? We have a martensite site start temperature, and as we cool down, right, as we cool down, our volume fraction of martensite finishes, and we end up at this martensite finish temperature. There's hysteresis in it as we heat it back up. We have to go to a higher temperature before we revert, right? And eventually at the Martin site start temperature, right? I mean, above the Martin site start temperature, we get back to, to full cubic. And the athermal nature means that the transformation is not uh, generally time dependent, right? But if we hold at a temperature, right? So in this case, we're heating back up. If we hold at a temperature, we stabilize the interface, right? And so that means if we keep heating, we need to get come up to a higher temperature again before we start transforming. Uh, before we start transforming. Right. So the kinetics of it are not um, uh, always super straightforward. We can also have in some systems, this is iron nickel, 30% nickel. There is actually a small a thermal component. So what this graph is showing, we quench to this temperature. Right, and you get the percent Martin site. But if we hold it at that temperature, if it was perfectly athermal, we wouldn't expect any additional Martin site growth. But what we do see is that if you hold it for long, relatively long periods of time, you get a couple additional percent of Martin site that forms. Right, this doesn't happen so much in carbon steels, but in other iron systems. We have a small, right? And notice the scale of this, right? So we've got 70 at, at these, this higher temperature. So let's just pick 192, right? We have 81% a thermal Martin site that forms by quenching to that temperature. And then we have go to 85. So we have an additional 4% that will grow isothermally, right? So it's a small, com small component, but it, it is there in, uh, some systems, a lot of systems, we get burst phenomena where we cool down, and then once we hit the Martin site start, you get a huge uh, amount that forms really, really quickly, and then it looks more like a regular uh, curve. And basically, um, this is a uh, autocatalytic effect, right? So basically the Martin site, you're, you're undercooling, you're undercooling, you're building up the driving force. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of it happens at once. You get large shears, right? Remember, we've got 20% shears happening with uh, uh, some volumetric component, and boom, all this happens at once, and you get a shock waves locally in your that start propagating through. And that actually will trigger the volumetric strain associated with that shock wave will actually trigger other Martin site nearby to form, right? This is an, it's an exceptionally violent transformation, right? You've got a 20% shear in your lattice. You need to accommodate all that deformation locally. So you've got plastic deformation going on nearby. You've got shock waves, pro propagating through um, and so basically if you start the formation of one plate you'll get a whole bunch we also see this burst phenomena in in steels 
So you can see one plate forms and then a whole bunch of other plates form off it as a result of this, this burst phenomenon. We also see this burst phenomenon when you hit uh, uh, grain boundaries or other obstacles and uh, the mechanical fields get very convoluted, right? And we get very large dislocation densities because of the uh, plasticity that's um, uh, happening. This is just a, a repeat of that at lower carbon. We get uh, slipped at higher carbon, um, uh, twinned. Okay. Nucleation of martensite. I'm not going to uh, even touch this with a 10 foot pole. Right. There is twin nucleation there. Uh, there's, there's disagreement, right? But there's a couple sort of clear theories where you can say, well, at least this picture makes sense. Right. With martensite, we don't have that. <laughs> Right, we've got a whole bunch of competing ideas. Um, there's no clear winner ideas, right? That are even worthwhile to to throw out and say, this is pedagogically useful, even if it's not true, because it explains so much, right? The pole mechanism was at least a clear picture. The grain boundary, the grain boundary nucleation and twinning, the argument between a thermal or uh, Diffusionless and diffusional transformation in bainite, right? At least was sort of thought provoking, right? Here, this is just the field is just a mess still. Um, and Martin site, right? We can form under two very different conditions, right? We have a thermal, but we also showed that we have some thermal components sometimes. We have, um, um, yeah, Porter and Easterling covers this coherent nuclei. There's three different theories that are sort of covered in Porter and Easterling. The coherent nucleation, nuclei theory, right, which means that this grows, martensite nucleates very much like any other nucleation in growth process. We have thermal fluctuations that lead to the nuclei and then that take off. Um, Dislocation mediated nucleation, uh, nucleation or elastic strain energy mediated nucleation theories, right? They're in Porter and Easterling. I, I, if you're curious, go through them, but I don't think they're, it's worthwhile to add that sort of content to the class. Okay, growth um, of martensite. So unlike bainite, the growth of martensite plates does not have the twofold nucleation of, of nucleation. Thermal activation is not a factor at all, right? No matter what the uh, um, temperature, right, the plates always grow to their final size very, very quickly, right? So um, they also grow at the order of... Uh, the shear wave velocity um, of the material. So that means a sizable fraction of the speed of sound, right, is the rate that twin that Martin site grows. Okay. So that's why when I, you know, if, if that wasn't observed, right, and this has been, uh, Observed to happen at the at great speeds, even at liquid helium temperatures, right? So if this wasn't the case, if growth wasn't so fast at all temperatures, then we could just say, oh, the isothermal Martin site that we observed was just that we've nucleated, but they don't always grow as fast, right? It could be that the the growth catching up with the nucleation, mm -hmm. but the fact that growth is so quick. It meant that that isothermal martensite curve that we saw, it had to be because of some, mar some of that martensite nucleating isothermally, not just athermally. Right? 
And so uh, we know it's it's diff diffusionless, right? We because there's no mechanism by even short range diffusion, even if we had like a massive type transformation where it's just atoms hopping from one side of a growing in, of, of an interface to the other to grow it. We know that that takes some time, right? And that that should have a temperature dependence, right? So the growth of that front should slow down with temperature, but that doesn't happen. Okay, so we're we're in good good. To, to finish this up. So stress-induced martensite, right? That was all we talked about. Thermal, right? We can also have um, stress-induced, and this gives rise to the pseudoelastic effect in shape memory alloys, right? Where basically we load it up. This is a stress-strain curve. We load it up, and then as we yield, we actually drive a martensitic transformation, right? So our parent phase is now going to martensite, and then we can get up to, say, 8% strain in this copper uh, uh, zinc system. Then when we release it, we get some initial elastic unloading. Then the martensite transforms back to the parent to continued to continued unloading. So we can have, this is called pseudo-elasticity because it is recoverable, right? But there's a hysteresis loop, right? There's a uh, energy loss associated with this, right? So it's not true elasticity. It's a phase transformation that, um, that uh, gives rise to this. And there is a temperature dependence. The Martin site start and the Martin site finish temperature and, and the austenite start and the martensite start temperatures or stresses depend on the temperature. Right, so this would be the martensite start stress. This is the austenite start stress where we unload and we start to transform back. Right, so the pseudo elastic effect has a strong temperature dependence. And if you get too high in temperature, right, well, Right, we can, uh, or too low in temperature, either or, totally screw this up. Okay, so related to that is the shape memory effect, right? Everyone's seen the night and all wires, right? It's the similar type of thing, except now we're deforming below the Martin site start temperature, right? The pseudo elastic effect is if we're deforming above Martin site start, right? But below Martin site finish. I said that backwards, right? Because Martin site start has to be higher than Martin site finish. All right, so here we we're deforming all Martin site. So we have a stress strain curve that looks looks normal, but we can go sort of around this uh, this thermal loop. Right, so if we start with the parent crystal, we cool that's at an elevated temperature, we cool it to martensite. Right, so now we've got 24 variants of martensite. We deform, and now we have a deformed martensite crystal. Right, we unload, we don't have any shape change, but then we heat it back up, and when we transform back to the parent phase, all the martensite goes, goes back to the austenite and we retain, we go back to our original shape, right? So the shape memory effect is due that we're, because we're deforming in the martensite shape and when we revert back to austenite, we recover our original, our original shape. So the last couple minutes, um, I want to hit a couple quick things in. Oh, that got screwed up. In steel, so here we see uh, the pole figure. This is if we have a single crystal, an ideal 
uh, cube grain. So our A, B, and C cubic axes are aligned perfectly well with the uh, um, trans, uh, the, the sample axes. And we deform it. These are the pull figures that we'll see for the Nishiyama of Osterman and Kurjumov sacks, right? So Kurjumov sacks, we, we get 24 different Martin site, possible Martin site variants, right? There are 24 ways that we can maintain that orientation relationship. Nishiyama of Osterman, we actually only have 12, right? So you can see that the pull figures are closely related, but these two variants under Nishiyama Wasserman move close together and overlap. If we measure pole figures experimentally, we get something that looks like this or like this, right? Where we see these sort of clouds of points, right? It's not clear which one of these, if any, is right because it's, we don't get a single sharp point, right? Each one of these dots is a crystal. Right, right, and there's reasons why that we may get cloudy points like this, a cloud of points, because there's it could either be that there is a true orientation relationship, but just the the plasticity that accompanies the Martin site transformation wipes it all out. Oh, we're we're sort of at the end, so I'll I've got like three slides related to this that we'll finish up on Wednesday after the quiz and then move on to uh, heat treatments, heat treatments of steels.